Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship from Bisco Presbyterian Church. Uh, We welcome those who are here, those in the fellowship hall, and those who are joining us online. Glad that everyone could be here for worship this morning. It's good to be back. Good to see you. Been on the, uh, got my experience going through the big terminal in Chicago and lived to tell the tale. But it's, uh, I was telling the lesson I learned is that people don't talk to each other. You got a mask on and they don't make eye contact and you know if you need something you can ask and they'll answer and then it's that's it they don't used to on the plane you could talk the whole flight you know to somebody not anymore everybody's got their phone and they're you know so it's different you have to work a little harder to communicate and i'll be glad when y'all can get your mask off and i can see what you look like again so it is good to see you here glad that we can be here glad that we can worship Just do continue to remember Dorothy Stevens' family in your prayers as we buried her brother Leonard yesterday. And uh, I know they will appreciate you continuing to lift them up in prayer. Our call to worship this morning comes from the psalmist, Psalm 28. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I praise him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we come just as we are. There's no other way we can come. We may fool ourselves, even fool others, but we don't fool you. And you, in your mercy and grace, receive us just as we are. Oh, how we thank you that as your children, you pick us up and you love on us. You're delighted that we are here. For you have drawn us by your spirit, and we thank you. Oh, how we pray that you, Holy Spirit of God, would move in our hearts, move in our midst, so that Jesus would be exalted, so that the word of God would be declared in our songs, in our prayers, in our readings, in the preaching of the word, that we would hear the voice of God, and we would see Jesus, and we would meet you here. Thank you. Thank you for your great love for us, a love that would send your Son to die for us on Calvary's cross. Thank you that you've given us faith that we might believe and you by your spirit have changed us and we're not the same. Oh, how we thank you for saving grace in Jesus Christ. This same Jesus who taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Let's continue our worship singing, O oh, Worship the King, and let's stand together as we sing. be seated. If you'll open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4, First Peter chapter 4, Peter writing at the end of his life, 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12, this is the word of God. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer... It should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household, and if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. Let's stand together for the prayer of confession. Almighty God, we have erred and strayed from your paths. We have too often followed the desires of our own hearts. We have sinned against your holy law. Forgive us and cleanse us, not because we are worthy, but because you are merciful and gracious to your children. Restore us that we may live godly lives with joy to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Our assurance of pardon this morning comes from Acts chapter 10 and verse 43. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Let's affirm our faith this morning using the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated.
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for loving us. Loving us in ways that we will only discover in eternity. Loving us with an inexhaustible love that will never, ever, ever be depleted or used up in all eternity. Thank you. Thank you that you've revealed yourself to us. Even though we can't grasp these concepts, we can know you. And we've seen your love displayed on Calvary's cross and know that you love us in a way that we fully cannot comprehend. Not now, not ever. For such is your love that you would send Jesus to die for the likes of us. Oh, how we thank you, how we praise you, how we thank you for drawing us to him and changing us. Thank you for a living relationship with you. No, we're not where we want to be, but we're not where we were, and we see your good hand at work in us, and we praise you. Lord, that's true for us as individual believers, but it's true for us as a church as well. And we pray that as your body here in this place, your church here, that we would continue to grow in our relationship with you, with each other, that the world may see that we belong to you because of the way we love one another. Lord, we do pray for Dorothy Stevens' family and the loss of her brother. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would comfort them as only he can. We pray that you would comfort them and draw those who need to know you. Lord, those who do know you, encourage their hearts with the truths of your word. But Lord, may they see Jesus, the one who conquers death, the one who is our hope and strength, even in the face of death. Lord, we thank you for Dorothy and her witness to us, her love for all of us, and we pray that you would comfort and console her in this time as well. Thank you for bringing me back. It's always good to go home. And Lord, thank you for taking care of my sister and pray that she'd continue to improve and get stronger every day. Lord, your timing is impeccable. And Lord, I thank you that I could go and could travel safely and can come back. It's just good to be here. Uh, Lord, I thank you for this church, these people. They're just the best, and I thank you for them. Thank you for the privilege of being their pastor. Thank you that we get to share life together. Lord, thank you that pandemics and deaths and sicknesses, family struggles, financial struggles, celebrations and joys, weddings and births and promotions and retirements, all those things we share together because you've knit us together and how we thank you. We pray that you would continue to grow us, that our witness would be strong in this community, that people would see Jesus in us. And Lord, we pray when people drive by this building, what they'll say is, if you go there, you're going to hear the word of God and you're going to find people that love Jesus and love you. Lord, I pray that would just increase, that more and more people would know that we care because of the way we live every day among them. Lord, I know school year is winding down and I pray for our teachers and administrators and students. May they finish well. I know they can see the, the end point and sometimes we just are weary and we kind of, Start coasting. I pray they would finish well. Lord, keep them safe. Lord, as folks work and we're out and Lord, sometimes we're not exactly sure what to do. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Shake hands, don't shake hands. Stop and visit, don't stop and visit. Lord, help us to do the right thing and protect us. Lord, we want to honor you and we want to love our neighbor. And sometimes this COVID business gets in the way of that. So help us to know how to do that through it. 
and that we would be good witnesses and good examples. We love you, Lord Jesus, and thank you for speaking to us through your Son, through the revelation of your creation, but most especially through your Word. Speak, Holy Spirit, through your servant, that we would hear the Word of God proclaimed, and hearing it, that we would receive it and be changed by it. May Jesus be exalted and your name praised, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll open your Bibles to John 15, John 15, I know you probably think we're never going to get through John 15, but I promise, Lord willing, next Sunday we'll get past John 15 into John 16, but it's been so good. I mean, it's just good. It's, it's blessed me, and I trust that it's blessed you as well. John 15 We'll begin at verse 9. You remember Jesus is giving his last instructions, his last words to his disciples, and their concern has been that he's told them he's going to leave them. What does that mean? We don't know an existence apart from you. How will we make it? How will the ministry, what ministry, can there be a ministry if Jesus is not physically present? It is these concerns that Jesus has been addressing, and he continues that. You remember last time Jesus introduced the concept of the vine and the branches, that he's the vine, they draw their life from him. And so we continue that discussion in verse 9, John 15, verse 9. This is the word of God. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I, called you, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Jesus' relationship with his disciples is much, much more than that of a master and his followers, of a teacher and his students. He has taught them that they draw their very life from him, that they are to obey him, and that they are loved by him. This morning we see that another way he describes their relationship is as that of friends. Never think for a minute that Jesus is saying, you're my good buddies, you're my chums, you're my pals. That's not the sense in which he says that. He never ceases to be God. He never ceases to be the master. But they are in a unique relationship with him, an intimate relationship with him, a privileged relationship with him. His friends know his heart. They know his plans. They know what he's up to. Servants don't know those things, but friends do. They know the reasoning behind his actions because he loves them. And although they remain servants, they're close to him, sharing his life, sharing his ministry. In fact, they will continue that ministry. And when you think about it, what a remarkable and awesome truth that Jesus treats his disciples, Jesus treats his followers as friends. Not just servants, 
not just those students who will take his teaching, but he calls them friends. John's narrative continues with Jesus' final instructions, and he says, verses 9 through 11, remain in me. This is our responsibility. His responsibility is to provide for us. Remember, he's the vine. He is our life source. The nutrients we need spiritually must come from him. We can't do it on our own. We can't make it on our own. We will not bear fruit apart from him. We will not live spiritually apart from him. So if you have that Wild West attitude of, I got it. I understand what you're saying. I got it from here, Jesus. You, you can ride off back to your throne. I've got you covered. You're going to fall flat of your face. Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. I remember one time seeing some comedy western, one of those black and white things, and the guy jumps off the roof, and he jumps off and hits the horse backwards. So he's facing the backside, and the horse takes off, and it, it was hilarious the way it was set up. And they said, that's a good picture of what it's like when you try to be a follower of Christ and doing it in your own strength and your own wisdom. You, you're just going the wrong way all the time. Jesus said, I'm the life source. You survive because of me. Remember, they're so concerned about being separated. He says, no, you are always bound to me. We're in a relationship that won't be broken. It'll be different now, but it won't be broken. I'm going to provide for you everything you need because this relationship is a lasting relationship. What is your responsibility in this relationship? Abide. Abide. How do we abide? Verse 10, by obeying. You say, but I don't want to go to church this morning. At 7.30, my body says, 30 more minutes. When I sat up and stood up, my knees said, you can't go today. By the time I walked around the end of the bed, my knees said, I think we might make it. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You see, you come not because you feel like it every time, not because you're on some spiritual high and so you're madly in love with Jesus, so we must do this, that, and the other. No. What does he say? He says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves. If you're able to be in worship, be in worship. Why do you go? Because you love Jesus, and loving Jesus means you obey him. Read the word. You say, well, I'm not, I, hey. Your argument's not with me, it's with Jesus. So the Holy Spirit will lead you into truth. My word is truth. So you want to know the truth of Jesus? Study his word. Satan will fight you tooth and nail when you begin to commit to read the word. Everything will happen. You do it anyway. Prayer. Oh, man, you want to see the devil come to life? Just commit to pray. I can lay down and be wide awake. I'll start praying. Two things are good that come out of that. One, I'm praying for folks. And secondly, sleep comes so fast. Isn't it amazing? I mean, I can be at my desk working away and something will hit me and I'll say, boy, I, I need to pray about that. And I'll stop and I'll start praying. The phone will ring. The cat will start squalling about something. Cat never squalls till I start praying. It's normal. It's part of it. And you keep doing it. You say, but I'm not a good prayer. Nobody is. Just talk to God. That's what it means when Jesus says, you keep my commands. You walk with me in this relationship. You do the things you know you're supposed to do. And you don't do it to check off a list. You do it because you're walking with him. And you can't keep walking with him if you keep diverging off these ways that he's not going. 
That's why he tells us his word. We obey. You can't truly be in a relationship with Jesus Christ and walk in disobedience to his word. I know there are people who think they can, but they can't. And when they stand before God someday, they'll find out that they couldn't. Satan will have you believe the lie, but that's exactly what it is. They say, oh, well, I, you know, I made a profession of faith so I can live any way I want to. Okay, but that doesn't mean you know Jesus. Doesn't mean that you have his assurance that you belong to him. You can't live in constant rebellion against God and his word and claim his promises. Can two walk together except they be agreed? God said that through the prophet Amos. Speaking to a rebellious people, it's a real simple principle. Can two walk together and not go in the same direction? Not be moving toward the same goal, not having the same passion and conviction. And everybody that's taught a Sunday school class, a Boy Scout troop, a class in school from little bitty ones to postgraduate, if you don't have people on the same page, it's tough to get them where they need to go, isn't it? And you see, students, well, I know the syllabus says, but, is that right, Dale? I know everybody else is supposed to do that, but somebody's mama told them they were the exception. Wrong. Not if you want to get where you're supposed to be going. You see, that principle is true in life, but it's especially true in relationship with Jesus Christ. What's his purpose? To prove he can make us conform? No. So that you will share my joy and my joy will be complete in you. It's a joy that you will experience regardless of the circumstances. And I think of Paul in that Philippian jail. And he and his partner have been beaten for the gospel. And what are they doing? Moaning and complaining, saying, we're going to tell the elders when we get back, don't send us on any more of these trips. No. They're rejoicing and praising God. And you go, how in the world can they do that? Because the joy of Christ filled their hearts. And the story wasn't over and Jesus wasn't finished. And you know the rest of the story. Jesus said the purpose in this is not to make you conform, not to make your life miserable, but to share my joy. Who is Jesus? God the Son. So when he talks about joy, do you think he knows what he's talking about? So when he says, I want you to experience my joy, do you think that's a good thing? Yes. And when he says, I want you to have it completely. He said, man. That is a loving master who would share his joy with us so that in him we could be complete. That's how you sing songs when you're beaten and in chains for the gospel. That's how you can praise God when you're in the emergency room and you're scared to death. You go, Lord, thank you. Then no matter how this turns out, it's going to be okay. Thank you that I can ask you to take care of my wife, my child, my, my family, my, my co-workers, all these. Say, Lord, thank you. Thank you that if I go, it's going to be even better. Isn't that what Paul writes and says? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I'm ready to go. But I know it's better for me to stay right now. You remember that? That's this that Jesus is teaching fleshed out. So we can see what it looks like. Now Jesus moves from speaking of this relationship. And he fleshes it out even more because he says... This is what it's like to abide in me now. I want to tell you something. You're not just my students. You're not just my disciples. 
but I count you as my friends. And he says, verse 13, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Think about the Old Testament. There's a man who was called the friend of God, Abraham. Abraham never ever said, God is my friend. He knew better. But God could say of his servant Abraham, he's my friend because I tell him what I'm doing. I share my heart with him. But long before we read about that, we see Abraham who heard the voice of God say, leave this place, your homeland, and go to a place I'm going to give you. And he gets up and moves. Abraham obeyed God. He followed God. He was faithful to God. God tells him, I'm going to give you a son in your old age. And Abraham believes him. So when God is going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham's nephew Lot lives there, God says, I'm going to tell Abraham what I'm up to. Why? Because he's my friend. Isn't that precious? Jesus says, this is how I look at you. You are not just servants here to do my bidding. You're my friends. And the greatest proof I can give you is that I will lay down my life for you. The Apostle Paul writes about that in Romans. Except Paul gets to the point and says, look... It was while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He said, rarely will somebody die for a good person. Rarely will somebody pay the ultimate price for a noble cause. But Jesus laid down his life for those who were his enemies. You and me. It wasn't when we were lovely Christ died for us. It was when we were sinners. Filthy, rotten, condemned, spitting on him, screaming, crucify him. He's saying, Father, forgive them. They don't realize what they're doing. Jesus says, you're my friends because I'm willing to lay down my life for you. Then he says, verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. There we come back to that. We don't do what he commands to be his friends. We do it because we are his friends. It's the old faith and works argument. The reason you see my works is because I have faith. I don't do the works to be saved. There, there is evidence of the salvation that exists. The relationship that exists is seen in their obedience. He says, you're my friends if you obey me. You see, we're in this relationship. Now, you know, we've taught that the relationship's even deeper than that. Because we're betrothed to Christ. We're his beloved. You want to get blown away someday, just sit down when it's quiet, get that time, think on that very thought that Jesus Christ is engaged to us. We're already married to him. He is our lover, our redeemer. He is preparing a place to bring us to himself so that we can live forever in that most intimate of relationships. We will live as a child with his or her father, for we will live with God the Father. We will live as a spouse, the wife of the Lord Jesus. The church is his bride. That's how close a relationship he wants to have. And so if you're going to have that kind of intimate relationship, you have to be honest, don't you? And that's what he's saying. 
I tell you what I'm doing. I tell you what my plans are. I tell you what the purpose of everything I'm doing. I tell you what the Father has told me. We're not keeping secrets from you. And if you read on, you see, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything I've learned from my Father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me. I chose you you and appointed you you remember these disciples are so worried about the ministry continuing and what's going to happen and their relationship with Jesus he says I have appointed you I've chosen you that you might go and bear fruit fruit that will last we're here because of their ministry If the Lord tarries, there will be those who are in the kingdom because of our ministry that God has chosen to use us to touch their lives, to bring the gospel to them. Fruitful. Fruit that lasts. And he says, because you're in this relationship with me, you are in a special relationship with the Father so you can ask him and he will answer your prayer. This relationship, instead of being broken with the disciples, is only strengthened and deepened and richer. Sometimes I send you little notes and I say, I pray your relationship with the Lord Jesus grows so that it will be deeper and richer and sweeter. Sometimes we think of relationship with Christ as being so hard. He's not a hard taskmaster. I am. I'm brutal. Man, I drive myself into the ground sometimes. Not him. He doesn't. Nobody loves me like he does. I've never run to the Heavenly Father that he didn't bend down and pick me up. Sometimes I was really dirty. I'd been playing in the mud and I'd fallen. And he doesn't say, you get yourself cleaned up, then we'll see. No, he says, come here, Dad. Dad, I messed up bad. I know. I deserve you to kick my tail from here to Paducah and back. I know. But the price for that sin's already been paid. It's already been forgiven. How can you put up with me? Because I love you in a way you cannot even begin to understand. But you will. So one day when my little girl comes and says, Daddy, I messed up. How did I respond? After all I've done for you. (laughs) All right, you work it out and then you come back and we'll talk and see if we can have fellowship. I picked her up and I held her and said, I love you. I've already forgiven you. Let's see what we need to do. We'll change your clothes. We'll get you cleaned up. We'll get you back on the right path. Where did I learn that? from knowing Jesus, from studying his word, from knowing that's how my heavenly father treats me. That's how we learn to love one another. And you see Jesus keeps repeating this command. Why? Because he knows that the time is coming when the events will will do everything to push these disciples apart and destroy the ministry. He says, you love one another. It's interesting. The verb is to keep on loving. It's an imperfect, keep on loving. And the word for love is agape. Love with God's love. It's not emotional, not when you feel like it. It's an act of the will. You do what love does. And you keep on doing it for one another. 
we're told that when those patriots in 1776 signed the Declaration of Independence, that Benjamin Franklin supposedly said, we must indeed all hang together or we most assuredly will all hang separately. I've quoted that often, but I actually looked it up for this sermon to make sure I had my facts right. Benjamin Franklin was a humorist. He was hilarious sometimes, but he wasn't being funny here. He was making a statement of fact because he says, men, if we don't hang together and if we're not successful, they will hunt us down and they will hang us separately as traitors. If you know your American history, you know that Nathan Hale was hung as a traitor because he was a revolutionary. Remember that? American History 101. Yeah. Jesus knew that what was facing his disciples was even more radical than that. And he knew the one thing that could not destroy them was love. Because his love would defeat their sin. His love would bring victory they couldn't even begin to understand. His love would pave the way for the giving of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. His love would bring life out of death when he rose from that grave. He knew that his love at work in them would not only keep them together, but his love in them would change their world. And it did read the book of Acts. The Acts of the Apostles. Now, are you a friend of God? Oh yeah, I'm a friend. No, I, would he say you're his friend? Would Jesus say, that's my friend? Well, how do you know? He loves me. He obeys me. And he loves the brethren. She loves me. She obeys me. And she loves her fellow believers. That's how you know. You say, but I'm not perfect at it. They weren't either. But it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, not you in you, the hope of glory. Jesus said, they're never going to understand what they're about to go through, but I do. And it's my love alive in them that will make the difference. And because of their relationship with Christ and their relationship with each other, God used them to change their world. He's using us to make a difference in our world. And the blessed privilege is that we get to be more than just disciples who learn principles and apply them to get a grade. We're in this most intimate of relationships where we know the great king. You say, preacher, I don't know him like that. You can. You can. Come to the cross. Confess your sin. Receive Christ. Let him change you. You say, preacher, I know what you're talking about. No, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I was. You're right. This is so good. This is so true. Then rejoice. Give thanks. And keep doing the right things. Keep loving him and letting him love through you. It's amazing. There is no other life. You say, well, it must be easy being a Christian. No, I'm telling you that in spite of the fact that it's hard. I remember when I was home and my brother-in-law sent a text and said, I came home from work and your sister was passed out on the floor. She's in the emergency room and she's positive for COVID. She was sick. Thankfully, she didn't have the breathing issues, but she was sick. She's still dragging. And I told my mom, read her the text, and we prayed. 
We got a text about six, seven hours later and bringing her home. They've given her antibodies, they've given her fluids, and she's a lot better off at home. When I read that text, my mama cried. She said, I was so scared. I didn't know it. She didn't act scared. She's mama, she's strong. And she said, you and your sister will always be my little boy and girl. And she said, all I could think of, Lord, if it's my time, keep me faithful. You see, it's not always easy walking with Jesus. But I can't imagine walking without him. One day it will be our time. And my prayer is that they'll say, oh, Jesus was so good. Because if you knew what a hard-headed servant that man was, it had to be Jesus to get him through. Precious and sweeter. Why? Because we're his friends. And he gives himself for us. Can we do any less for him? Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us so. Thank you for showing us your power and your love in the everyday of life. Oh, we would want the extraordinary, but most of life is every day. And you are there every day. And you've called us to what the world says is ordinary. But it's not ordinary for us. It's life. And thank you that you're there and you use us to make a difference. Glorify yourself in us. And if there's one who would today say, I do not know Jesus, may they know him before this day is over. And that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is Take Time to Be Holy, and let's stand together as we sing.
Receive now the benediction. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.